Well, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 11 uh, tonight. And uh, I know that you have studied Hebrews chapter 11 multiple times. But have you ever studied it after having studied the first 10 chapters of the book of Hebrews? Because I suspect every time you've ever looked at Hebrews chapter 11, it's been taken somewhat out of, well, maybe not out of context, but it doesn't fit the context with the first part of the book. Because every time we go to Hebrews chapter 11, what's our subject? The subject's always faith. But the book of Hebrews through chapter 10, and it'll be returning later, has had the subject of what? We've covered it over and over again. What's the book of Hebrews about? Staying the course. Because people apparently to whom this writer is writing have grown weary or they've grown frustrated or they've just grown tired of doing good or Satan has gotten a hold of them. Whatever it is, they're going back to the world they used to be in prior to coming to Christ. And so over and over and over again, the writer of the book of Hebrews has said, why would you do that? What you have in Jesus Christ is better. And a couple of times he's gotten really strict and said, why would you do that? Because if you keep, if you do this, you're putting yourself in great, great jeopardy before God. And he's very direct about that. So why in the world we now, after talking at the end of chapter 11, and in the original text, there was no chapters, no verses. It was just all put together. When he's talking about don't be among those who shrink back, how do we get to the subject of faith? What sense does it possibly make? Well, faith is a, without faith, it would be harder to stay the course. Okay. Greg's right on target. He said, without faith, it's harder to stay the course. But faith, faith is all about looking forward. Faith is all about holding on. Faith is all about believing when it seems impossible to believe. Faith is all about trusting when there's no possible reason to trust. Uh, at least in a human form, you know. And so now he begins to talk about another giant subject that is designed by its whole nature to keep us on track. And so we begin verse one, and we have often said that verse one is the what of faith? Definition. The definition of faith. Well, it may be, but it's talking about at least in my mind, what faith does for us in contrast to shrinking back. So listen how it says. It's being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we don't see. Now, if you are of a mindset that you've grown tired and you've grown weary and you're just sick of all this and you want to give up, what does he say faith is doing for you? It's making you sure. And it's making you certain. Even though you don't see it, you don't understand it, you can't figure it out. You're sure and you're certain. Uh, is that, that kind of ring some bells with you? That kind of kind of understand what that's doing? So instead of shrinking back and giving up, Faith calls me to be, even when I'm weary, even when I'm beaten up, even when I'm really, really tired, even when I'm really, really disgusted, to be sure and, and, and to be certain. Though I don't, don't see it, I still am sure and certain because I, I, I can hope for it. So this becomes the the major centerpiece of our continuing to live in a world that battles constantly against us. Uh, and the world is battling constantly against us. More so than, than 
than maybe we've ever seen in our lifetime. The world is battling against us. I, I spent uh, 50 minutes on a Zoom call today with a man in Manitou Springs or Colorado Springs. And he's a part of something called Summit Ministries. And they spend a lot of time with young people trying to talk to young people about how to live by their faith in a world that's so troubled like this. And it was fascinating for me to listen to him about living by your faith in a world that's so complex. And what he said is, it's battling against us in every single direction. But he said, if you would think about it, that's the way it's always been. The subject has just changed. The battle's gotten, maybe it feels a little more intense, but there's always been a battle against us. And as Christians, we're living in that space between these battles. And we have to know how to navigate it. We have to know who we are. Faith is knowing who we are. And so he says, this is what the ancients were commended for. This is what God appreciated by our heroes of old. This is what they were commended for. And, and we've already studied that over and over again, that God would look at their faith. In fact, in the book of Romans, where we've been now for a long time, he looked at the faith of Abraham and it was credited to him for what? Righteousness, righteousness. And that is a giant statement because in the book of Romans, we are taught so very plainly that righteousness is not something that you and I can ever get by ourselves. It's impossible. There's not anything you can do. You'll never be good enough. You'll never be perfect enough. You can't keep laws well enough to have any piece of righteousness in yourself. In fact, we're taught that our righteousness, the best we could produce would be like a filthy rag in God's sight. It's all stained, it's all messed up. But the book of Romans makes this grand announcement that by God's grace through Jesus Christ and through our what? Through our faith, God will cover us with his righteousness. And that's what the ancients were commended for because they absolutely trusted God. Now, the question is, how much do they trust God? How much did they do that? Well, it's by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Uh, so on the call today with this man from Manitou Springs, wonderful call. Uh, we may make a trip up there. Susan, I may make a trip up there to sit and talk with them. Uh, but I talked to him about my story. I've told you over and over again how there are theologians who say there are stories in the Bible that just aren't real. This has happened recently, very recently at a place I know where someone with great Bible knowledge says the book of Jonah is not real. It could not be possible. It's fictitious that a fish could swallow a guy and he could live in those stomach acids for three days and come out of that alive. It's impossible. And when a person told me that she had heard that in her class, someone very close to me, I said, Faith is something that you choose. It's something you choose to believe. And so I said, what's any more strange about that story? What's any more difficult to believe about that story than the story of God speaking this world into existence? I mean, which is harder? I believe a fish can swallow a guy and he can live through it or believe that all this came because God spoke it into existence, which is the bigger deal. Well, I'm telling you, when you look at this universe and all its magnificence and all of its, its expanse, and you see what it's really like, far beyond what any of our telescopes can ever produce in terms of its magnitude, its glory, 
a fish swallowing a guy and a guy getting out of it, it's not that big a deal. <laughs> so it's by faith. It's by faith. It's by our confidence in God that we what? We understand, we believe that the universe was formed at God's command. That, you know. Now, half, how many Americans believe that's not true? How many Americans believe that's not true? Well, a bunch of Americans believe it's not true. And a bunch of non-Americans believe it's not true. And people are educated routinely in schools of all kinds that that's not true. But as Christians who believe this book <clears throat> is real, we read the book and we conclude that we will believe, that we will trust, that that story written in the beginning of this book is indeed real. So it's by faith that I choose that. I choose to believe that. It's by faith that Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain. Uh, you can go back and debate that story <clears throat> all you want. I'll never in all my life get it figured out exactly how one was better than the other. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know exactly what one did and one didn't do in terms of what made it really better. Do what? Okay. Cain was suggesting that he didn't need to be forgiven for his sins. Okay. Attitude, it may be that. <clears throat> something that God created instead of raising up and taking care of the lamb. See, I don't know the answer to all that. I just know one thing about that story. One thing that's really true about that story. That Abel offered his sacrifice in a spirit of faith that was different from the spirit of Cain. I don't care if it's a piece of wood or if it's a piece of cloth or a, or a, or a lamb. or a, I don't know what the object was. That's not where the issue is in what they did. The issue was, by faith, he offered a better deal. It was out of his conviction, trust, confidence toward God. Does some of it have to do with obedience? I think a major part of faith is obedience. But it's, it's, I've always defined it like this. My favorite definition of faith is this. And it's not written anywhere. But faith is believing God enough that you'll do what he calls you to do. Just truly believing him enough that you will do what he calls you to do. That's why people like Elijah will be talked about. Because God would call Elijah, for example, to do things that we would not normally ever think we would do. Like, go talk to Ahab, the meanest ruler in the world of that day, and tell him it's not going to rain. And then tell him, you better get out of here. He's a mean guy. Go to the Kareth Ravine, and there'll be a little brook there from which you can take your water. And by the way, food will be a problem because I have birds send it to you. And, and how many times you heard me say, which one of us want that deal? I mean, from time to time, if you ever sit very long on a tractor, you'll see a bird carrying some food. And if he came and dropped it off at my place, I'm not sure I'd eat it. Okay? But 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 he doesn't even hesitate. He doesn't even hesitate. He just goes. And and from and from there, where does he go? To Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And he's supposed to be finding a a, a lady there that will have enough food for him. And it just doesn't make any sense to go to Zarephath in the region of Sidon, does it? Ahab's already really, really mad by this time because the brook has dried up. means there's no rain. It means the cattle are dying. In fact, the, the, the sides of the hill are dotted with the carcasses of dead animals. And to go to Zarephath in the region of Sidon, where Ahab's wonderfully beautiful, kind, precious wife named Jezebel, her daddy's king there. That's where she grew up. 
Now, of all the places to go hide, would that be where you want to go? And yet, what does he do? He marches right up there like he owns the place. He's not worried about anything. God told him to do it, he'll do it. Uh, it's, it's believing God to the point you'll do whatever God tells you to do. So yes, it has something to obedience. Uh, but that obedience will only, only work if you really, really trust. And even then, even then, you will never be perfect at your obedience. That's the interesting part of this story. Even then, you'll never be perfect at your obedience. Uh, it's impossible. So it's the trust part of this that God is looking to more than anything else. What's in your heart? Are you really trusting him? Well, I'm going to quit here in a second, but let me just this. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man. I mean, God spoke well of his offerings, and by faith he still speaks, even though he's dead. These examples of faith still are alive for us to, from which to learn. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life, so he did not experience death. Could not be found. God took him away. I don't know anything about Enoch. Do you? I don't know that much about him. I just know he must have been some kind of a guy. He must have been some kind of a wonderful guy living so much in confidence toward God that God just took him and he didn't have to taste of death. And by the way, the fellow we just talked about, Elijah, and I know, I know he wasn't perfect. I, I find Elijah, not very long in his story, under a tree saying to God, I'm, I'm not worth anything. I can't have been better. Any other prophets ever been sent before me. Just let me die. I, I want to die. And yet he's the man of faith that's so great that he and Enoch have a parallel story in one sense. God took them before they ever tasted of death. Isn't that interesting? And do you think faith means something to God? Do you think God's impressed with faith? Let me give you one little caution. I do believe in obedience. But you can teach obedience all day long and not teach faith. And you can take a ruler to people and get them to try to obey all kinds of things and not teach faith. And you can obey all you want to, but if it doesn't come from faith, you've really wasted your time. You've really wasted your time. Faith comes first. I've said it over and over and over again. Faith comes first. Then comes obedience. If you leave off the front part of that, the last part is just, an, as we call it, a cliche, an exercise in futility. It starts with your confidence and your trust in God. Now, if you trust God, will you naturally obey Him? Will you naturally follow Him? Yeah, and as John says, it won't be a burden to you. You won't find it to be a burden. His commands won't be laborious to you. you. Because you're doing it because you trust Him. You believe He created the world. So, if I live like this, and I really believe that God's on my side, and God's working for my good, and God's, God's able to do anything, and though I don't know how I'm going to make it through the next day with the, the forces that are upon me. But I believe God will see me through one way or the other in some fashion. Don't you think I want to stick with it? People of faith, true faith, have a hard time giving up.